A lot has happened since you and I fellowship together over this pulpit. Uh, my wife's sister-in-law uh, passed away, and we went to Detroit to be with them. She was, by my wife's report, one of the most wonderful people in all of her family, maybe the most wonderful person she knew in the family. And so the Lord helped us with uh, her brother Mort, and uh, we were encouraged and refreshed and lifted. That's wonderful when that happens at a funeral. It was a funeral of victory and of celebration in a very, very nice Presbyterian church. We came back with a surprise visit on that Wednesday night. It's nice to find most everybody in their place. That's what we found. We found most of the attending people in their place. And we received a wonderful welcome. I didn't make the mistake by saying this time I'm here to stay. Just said I'm passing through. Hi. <laughs> and then we were in the Florida for the 13th winter, the privilege of being with uh, Dr. and Mrs. Helm, with Edward and Jackie, staying with uh, Edward Helms, and, and it, was a, it was a lovely time. Um, by God's grace, in 13 winters, I had the best sleep in anyone's home outside of my own home that I've had when I've been in a home for several nights. Except for two nights, I'd wake up seven to eight in the morning. Ordinarily, I'm, I'm awake. Because of the prayer life here, I wake up somewhere around four to five. If not, the clock is set for five o'clock usually. But there, I'd sleep on to seven to eight. One time, 20 till nine. That's big stuff for me. <laughs> I don't go to sleep till usually in Scott Depot from anywhere from 11 to 2 or 3 in the morning. I'm not a good sleeper, so I read. And then sometimes in the morning, prayer time comes. And those can be wonderful and precious moments. Everybody else is asleep. They don't have God's attention. And... and uh, it, I feel like I got his attention more. I, it's not true because he's God. It's just me, you know. But they do tell me, the saints tell me that prayer between 12 and 4 is a very special time. I've heard that through the years with the great prayer warriors. Uh, for some reason, it also can be a time of great battle. But God is very precious and very near. So we had the privilege of being with them. I enjoyed the lunches. I enjoyed being by his side. One day we were with five or six ministers there at Diana's, and I thought that wouldn't be a good place, and Edward did too. thought it wouldn't be the best place to talk over anything. But Brother Helm said that's where we were going to meet, so we met there. By the time he finished with sharing, a, unless a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die to buy it alone, I was crying in this place and couldn't hardly keep the sobbing back and when he finished I thought it'd be fitting if we just pulled back the chairs and had an altar service right there right there at the place of lunch where this Jewish brother loves him so very much and I mean they love him walked in for his birthday and Brother Helm used the word embarrassment I have never used, never heard him use that word He's such a person of propriety. He knows that in most circumstances, embarrassment is not a good word for the vocabulary. I know it's in a dictionary. And if it fits, it fits. But if you listen to him real closely, you'll find out some words should be in quite often and some words should be used very sparingly. And you know how wonderful he is with superlatives. He doesn't use them very much. If he says something gorgeous, Pull out your notebook and mark that. <laughs> if he says it's great, mark that down because he means exactly what he says. And when he means exactly what he says, a superlative is a superlative. But we walked in that day and we were going to take a boat ride down the intercoastal Scott Depot 
so wonderfully had supplied the means to take a boat trip down the intercoastal and back up. That's where you see the beautiful homes, and there's one place you go up, it's like a Venetian canal, and there's beautiful buildings, some of the early homes built in Port Lauderdale back there. And, you know, they don't, they don't require much or ask for much. I asked him what he would like to do. He said, I think I'd like to take that boat trip down the intercoastal. And he said, this time, don't come back by the ocean, but come back up the intercoastal. I want to go down and come back. So that's what we did. But just before that, we had lunch at Diana's. And to our surprise, out came all these waitresses and uh, Lou's wife, the owner, Diane, with a little cake with candles, and they don't do that there. That's two places too busy. If they would get that policy, I don't know how they could ever take care of that. They just don't do it. But for the first time in his memory, no one had ever seen him. Here they came with this birthday cake and put it right in front of him. Diane, Lou's wife, had it, put it right in front of him. And they're not used to singing. You can tell that. It's not like this stuff you hear out, you know, out where they have to do it. And they seem to be, they seem to want to do it, but it sounds a little mechanical in the way they do it. Some of them have funny jingles, you know, and a lot of people. But Brother Helm said he, he was, he said, it, I was just embarrassed. I think he was embarrassed because it wasn't done in that place. And here he was sought out especially he felt like sliding down his chair. But he was blessed also. And their, the way they sang was so sincere and so wonderful and so precious. On the way out, I said, Lou, thank you for taking care of this servant. And uh, Lou said, we really, we really like him around here. I said, well, he really likes you too. I walked in a few days later, and he, I couldn't find him. He was supposed to be in there somewhere, and I'd been delayed... Lou says, back there praying for my help. They need it. You go back there and pray too. <laughs> oh, of course, back, yeah, I went back there. Lou said, he's, I hesitated. He said, go back there and pray. So I went back there with a baker, and this brother Helm prayed, and he prayed with two men, uh, uh, two black men, one from Haiti. It was a very precious experience in their love for him was obvious. Now this has been this has been a ministry that's developed simply because a man has good manners, dresses appropriately, but most of all has a Christian spirit, has a godly spirit. And as a result of that he's he's won not only the manager and his wife and the daughter, but he's won the whole place. And uh thought it was significant that somebody from the condominium They've never seen there before was sitting over to one side while he was there. Because, you know, God's working providentially to bring glory to his name and to his kingdom, to his servants. And so it was just a marvelous experience. One night we were called. He'd been waiting for some reason for me, some contribution he thought I might have since November to share with a man by the name of Joe, I believe. And Joe was the mayor, you know, those, it's laid out in cities. Joe uh, was the head of uh, mayor of these, you know, you can get thousands and thousands and thousands of people in these condominiums. They're the biggest cities, just a few of them. The Galt Mile, I think he's the mayor in that area there. And so here was a, na here was a native-born Israeli. And the manager wanted him since November to share with him. I mean the concoction they fix for us. Now, Dr. and Ms. Helm aren't fish people, but I'm a fish person. And the concoction they fit for us, Barbara will tell me what that is. What? Yeah, Bula Bays. That's what it is. I can't remember that. But uh, it was uh, exceptionally good. And, and uh, brought us out the Jewish bread and brought out this Bula Bays and and brought out the trimmings and the extras, and oh, they just kept bringing the food. Brother Helm shared with his wife for a while, and he shared around. Finally, Lou came and sat down, and finally, the gentleman that 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 uh, Lou had wanted, the owner had wanted him to share with since November. I want you to know that that gentleman, this Israeli uh, Jew, n never left Brother Helm for the two hours that he shared. 
I want you to know he shared about the, about the, the miracles, the warm air coming up Jordan. He shared, oh, it was, and that man said, that's it. That's what happened to Moses. He'd say, it was so wonderful, and he stayed right with it. Listen, you have to have God's hand on you to hear what another person who God has his hand on. You've got to have God's hand on you to listen to that I, because it's so above the normal conversation and so in the spirit. I marvel. He never left him. All the... All the people around and the coming and the going, that man stayed right with him, made his comments. And uh, Mrs. Helm talked also, and Barbara talked. We just, we just felt free. Here we were, we were, we were the honored guests for the evening, and here was this wonderful conversation that took place. I am so thankful that it's in keeping with the New Testament because they didn't have a building like this to even to go to. They met in the edge of the temple sometime, but most all their services took around took place around the dinner table. Nearly everything took place. Brother Helms pristine in his practice as far as the early church is concerned. Nearly everything took place over the time of eating. Of course, at the, in the New Testament, when they finished, they took the Lord's Supper. That is, they passed the elements because they knew what Hyman Appleman knew, that if you don't go to Calvary every day, your heart will get hard. So they continued in the Apostles' Doctrine and uh, they continued in the fellowship. They continued in the breaking of bread. That took them to Calvary every day. And they continued in prayer, having started constantly in prayer. And we were thankful for it. It seems like every lunch he has and every dinner he has is a worship service. And I think it's marvelous that you can be around a table and it can be so wonderful that you can't keep the tears back and you want to have an altar call and, and get started all over again or repent or get up the road further. Don't you think that's great? I tell you, it is wonderful by God's grace and by God's glory. I think it is because he is a sanctified man. I think it is because this work of God that is around him is because he is an entirely sanctified man. That is God's holiness is within him. To make it simpler than that, it's the presence of Jesus having full sway. I'm sure that's what gives him courage when I wouldn't have courage. And he sense, he's sensitive and tender and, and obviously concerned about responses to him. And knowing uh, that if you walk with Jesus, if you love Jesus, you've got things upset. Now, don't take be, having things upset as being holy. It may be upset because you don't have manners. It may be upset because you said amen when you wasn't supposed to. See, here's why we need to be entirely sanctified. We can praise the Lord it's not out of order, praise the Lord, in the gathering of the saints at all. But it can be out of order, out, out somewhere. It can be out of order out there. God can want us to be quiet. Say, how do you know that? Well, in Israel one time at the Shilohom Hotel, it was the Scott Depot newly saved group that were so excited and so praising the Lord that it frightened the people who were there and they couldn't hear what God's servant had to say and they were gone. We lost them over my people. See, see, we, we're, we're, really, uh, we're really difficult people. Our carnality, once you get saved, Jesus washes away your sins. If you don't go on to be sanctified, you become obnoxious. You become self-assertive and you don't even know it. And you think you're obeying the Bible when you're really being offensive. And you're hurting instead of helping. Uh, the ministry that John has and Larry at the Y is not because these men are obnoxious. I can tell you that. I don't remember anybody being upset with them up there. They're so careful and kind in their in their Christian manners. They don't they don't sell. They get around, have conversations, and I get in on them too. But most mostly, it's who they are and how they act when they come and go. And over a period of weeks and months and years, that may draw someone but one word spoken at the wrong time can keep somebody forever from coming into the kingdom of God just one word like do you know if you die if you died today that you'd go to hell 
Yet we're exhorted to talk like that. And I, Brother Helm has never, never given such an instruction. Unless that, that would be a rare thing. A very rare thing for us to approach anybody like that. Because unless the Holy Spirit's drawing them, our words are going to set up a blockade of which they can ever get over. Oh, we get real hard. We get real bucky. Because we're saved and we feel like we've got to show that we're Christians. And we've got certain scriptures. No, it's better to wait on God until we're sure. I believe we wait on God until we're sure we won't miss anything. I believe that. And I believe that if we're that sincere and if we're that sensitive and we're that tender in the things of God, that if we're supposed to do it, he'll, he'll help us to jump the gun of our reservation. First thing you know, we'll just make a word for Jesus. And just if we're that sensitive and, and we're not hard because there's more not to be said than there ever is to be said. And it's not in a multitude of words. It may just be in a word or two or a word said 20 some odd years later as it was with Jack. Just think we wouldn't have Jack with us if Brother Hammond opened his mouth one time and invited him to an altar prayer or told him he was a sinner man and why didn't he get saved. We wouldn't have him with us at all. And anybody that knows anything about Jack wouldn't want to ever do without Jack. And furthermore, when Brother Ham comes back, it seems like we ought to get him by the hand and congratulate him in Jesus for being quiet and not speaking to his son, for his son by marriage for over 20 years, and say, praise God, Brother Ham, if it weren't for your sealing, this is the most talkative man on the earth in the spirit. But with Jack, he didn't do it. Oh, he shared wonderful things about what Jesus was doing. He shared the thing, but he never said, Jack, don't you know you'll die? If you die today, you'll go to hell. Jack, in his unsaved condition, would have said, well, that's none of your business. Or he, I don't know what he said. He would not have said anything. He just heard him. He'd just been quiet, and that would have been it, and we wouldn't have seen Jack. Oh, oh, to have God's presence within us. Oh, to, oh, to have a tender heart. See, oh, it's so easy when we become a Christian, so easy for the carnal nature without it being sanctified and slain then to do more damage than anybody could ever do. Brother Hem said we can undo more in a few seconds than it's taken years for, for a men of God to do or for family to just undo it. Oh, just in a little bit, just undo it. That's a tremendous thing. See, well, then how in the world are we ever going to make it to the doing? Well, we're going to make it to the doing by waiting. <laughs> just going to plant our feet. You say, that doesn't sound like much to me. Well, it isn't much. That's what God wants. God's the everythingness anyway. And I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you, if you wait on God till the, till the fire of, I'm speaking over my head, but it's still true. If you wait on God till the fire of God hits your soul, let me tell you, I mean the real fire, not the fanatical fire, not the devil pushing but that doesn't mean we aren't saved, but it means we're out of order a lot of the time, and I fear most of the time, because there's very little witness on what's said and on what's done, very little witness over what's coming over the television station. In fact, it'd just be better not to look at most of it. Just so little witness on it whatsoever. But if you wait on God, he has said, wait upon him. That's why he told the disciples, tarry till you're endued with power from on high. He said, tarry, wait, there's a world going to hell. There was people dying. They were taking people to the graveyard every day. Why didn't they run out and try to save a few of the family while they were passing by? Why? It would have done just the opposite to those who were there. They weren't in the power of the Spirit. And so it was important for them to wait important for them, if you please, not to be just cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, but to be sanctified by the blood of the Lamb. And that's what Jesus died for. He didn't die primarily, listen to this carefully, primarily. He didn't die primarily to save us. He died primarily to sanctify us. Seems like to me I better have scripture for that, don't you think? Well, I came prepared for that one. Uh, not until about 6.25 this morning. I was lying there, and ordinarily I'm up at 5 through the week and on Sunday. But I didn't think I'd be preaching this morning. About 6.25, I could feel the call coming. I said, that call's coming. He's going to pray for anointing to be on me, and I better get up and get out of here. I didn't even get make, I didn't make it to the kitchen to get the coffee on until the call came. He said, be thou anointed in the Holy Spirit. 
You know, I said, oh, Jesus, I could feel it coming. Isn't it wonderful? I could feel it coming. Uh, wh- which tells you I'm way behind. <laughs> but it tells you that I'm more dependent. and tells you that I need Jesus more, and I beg your patience. But I do have a scripture that tells us, and it's, it has to do with the blood, but it's on over in that chapter because when I left you in this series, and my congregation, I think we left in the ninth chapter, this one is on over. And it's inserted in the closing remarks of this great man of God, the writer to the Hebrews. It's the 13th chapter, the 11th verse. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. Now that's an interesting, uh, I'll just make a short comment on that. Uh, throughout the week, this was on the Day of Atonement, but throughout the week or throughout the year, uh, most of these bodies that were burned, a portion of it was shared at the altar. It was eaten by the priest. But on the Day of Atonement, the bodies of both the bullock, that was for Aaron and sons, and the goat, that was for us, because there was a scapegoat that was turned loose in the wilderness, but there was also one burned for God, these, the bodies of these were taken outside the camp and burned. They were not, they were not eaten. The shoulder wasn't eaten. The part of it wasn't eaten. And uh, that symbol of fellowship did not take place. These bodies were burned. So he says, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy or to sanctify them through his own blood. Let us then go out to him, uh, go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. In the uh, King James, it says a little different from that, but maybe I ought to read that because most of you have probably the King James And the word sanctification is so prominent there, which is the same word as the word holy. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go, therefore, or let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Now, the blood which was shed for our sins is primarily for the life past. You and I have committed sin. You and I were born with a sinful nature, and we've done what God did not want us to do. And what a marvelous story, and what marvelous preaching it makes, and what a marvelous trip, and what a marvelous truth to be able to grip that the blood of Jesus washes away all of that disobedience and all of that sin. That has primarily do, to do with the life of the sin past. That's the blood. It washes them all away. It's incomprehensible. It's incomprehensible to me, yet it's factual that the blood of Christ, that Jesus would take his sins upon us in the Garden of Gethsemane and take them to the cross and there... Sin would be so thoroughly dealt with that it never had to be, there never had to be another sacrifice. I, I've looked at it for weeks, and I, I hope to preach on it one of these days, just that phrase, once for all. If you want to get the power of the blood, just think of once for all, done. Once for all, the perfect sacrifice. And if you were a Hebrew and you'd seen the animal slain just in one day, or in a lifetime, or if you knew your history and seen how much had happened in hundreds and hundreds of years, and the millions of animals that were slain. Look at Solomon's dedication of the temple. They talked about 20,000 animals and, and more than that. All of this, on and on and on and on, year after year, blood, 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 years, years, years. But when his blood was slain, the writer of the Hebrews says, once for all. Now, when God brings that revelation in on me, I've got a little of it, but when it comes in, I'd like to have the privilege to get behind the pulpit and let go on that one. I believe when I got through with it, we'd decide there was power in this blood. 
blood spilled, blood spilled, blood spilled, blood spilled, blood spilled, blood spilled, generation after generation after generation still had to be spilled and only did one thing, threw up an insignia, keeping the wrath of God back. But when this blood was spilled, something happened. And it happened so deep and so permanently and so wonderfully, it's never had to been spilled again and it never will. It never will. It's that powerful. Oh, to something. That's so great. That's so great. And just think in most all psychi- psychiatric places, they don't, they don't have the answer. All not taking away from psychiatry, but oh, if they could get the revelation of the blood. That's why Christian psychiatry is so important. Oh, if they could get that. Here it is, folks. Here it is. Here's the blood that takes away the guilt. Here's the answer. This is bearing on your mind. You can't get rid of it. But think of the blood so powerful that reaches into the conscience and it purges the conscience and takes away the guilt. And you have the knowledge, the spiritual knowledge that it's dealt with forever because you and I know in our own hearts that if something's wrong and out of order, it ought to be dealt with. You hear us say it. We'll say that man ought not to be loose. Some, there ought to, that man ought to have to pay a price. Why should he kill all these people? And we cry within our hearts, justice. And there's a cry from the time of Abel that there be justice. Justice not only in other people's lives, but justice in our own life. There has to be, and if it weren't for Christ, you and I would pay the very penalty for that. That justice would fall on our heads. We would be the ones to die. And yet he took, he took his sins for us and washed away our sins forever and ever, once for all, and we stand before him justified. Oh, it's great. That's a sermon. I can quit right there. But I'm talking about sanctification by the blood. However, there is within us, and that touches my heart when I tell you, there is within us a deposit made by Adam and Eve of something called the carnal nature, something that just wants to be selfish. And though we've been forgiven, and don't ask me why God didn't take care of the whole thing at one time, I don't know, but history tells us and all of Christianity tells us that he doesn't do with it, do it all at one time. I don't know if we could stand it. I don't know what the whys of it. I know one thing, he doesn't reveal how evil we are. But after we've prayed, prayed a few hundred hours, a few thousand hours, it starts coming up before us that we've been rather wayward, even in our, even in our justified life. We've been rather disobedient and rather picking and choosing what we want to do and what we don't want to do, going where we want to go and, and kind of figuring out and rationalizing how we want to do it rather than waiting for God until the blood purges, to, uh, purges us to such a manner that we really don't do, we don't do except when he wants us to do and go where he wants us to go. Oh, for that experience. I can hear Jewel playing now. She says, oh, for a heart like that. I thought, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, for a heart like thine. I could almost hear Roger singing it or John. And, and uh, you were probably saying with me, Jesus, oh, for a heart like, that, like thine. Well, that's what happens in sanctification. Sanctification means holiness. And it has to do, as we often think, don't, 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 thou shall not. And it's just some way or another, it's gotten into us like that. But sanctification is, or holiness is the perfection of God's nature. It's the perfect nature of God. And both His love and His wrath come out of His holiness. See, that's all in there. And I, I don't know how to explain that very well, but I know holiness includes all the attributes of God in some ancient, and it's, it's the perfectness of God. It's just what makes you love Him. It's just why he's so perfect and why he's so beautiful. Because he's holy and he does everything right. It is the, he is the perfect personality. You remember when you fell in love with your companion? You, you just loved her so much and you loved him so much. You, they just looked like they were perfect. Well, that's the way God looks. But God looks that way the next year. And God looks that way the next year. And he looks that way the next year. If you have a heart that's hungry for him because he is. See, it's the perfect personality. That's what it is. And it doesn't have taintedness in it. See, it's got... He always does what's right for himself. This is holiness. And does something else. He always does what's right for ourselves. 
for us if we listen to him. He did it with Jesus and prepared the way for everything. But if he, he, if he says go and stay, that's because he's doing what's right for ourselves. See, it's out of his holiness. But the carnal nature that's within us will resist that because the carnal nature has to be dealt with by the blood. There is something that for some reason God does not, I think one, maybe one of the reasons is he is not robotic. That is, he does not treat us like robots. We're convicted and we come to him because we're under conviction and we want to be changed. And what does he do? He just washes away our sins. But we don't want to be changed as much as we think we want to be changed. And we have to find that out. We think we want to be changed and we want to be forgiven. And who can stand this, who can stand this load of guilt? We've got to get that off of it. Isn't it good that he does that without telling us how really evil we are? He saves us. But the old sin principle is in there and it's a very evil principle. You know how you know it's evil? Because it'll criticize somebody and that's hell. Judgment belongs only to God, not to us at all. It'll put somebody down. That's hellish. It'll make somebody feel down. That's hell, feel bad. That's hellish. Now, all these things jump out of us. Why do they jump out of us? Because there's something lodged within the heart that's yet to be dealt with. And it, yet we're saved by the blood, covered by the blood. It's a miracle. It's a miracle of God that we can be saved and still have this old sin, sin principle in the heart. But we are. See, we're saved by God's grace. We're saved by grace. <laughs> through the merit that is in Christ. So, he calls us to sanctification. It says here, Jesus went outside the camp in order that we may be sanctified, that we may be holy. It was in the Roman book where he said that, that all things work together good in order that we might be conformed to the image of his Son. An awful lot of what we experience in hardships we should be rejoicing over because it's doing something with us it's taking the carnal nature out of us. This is the progressive aspect. It's doing something to take it out of us. See, the habit pattern has to be changed, but God made us co-creators with him, even in our own redemption, that is, in our own sanctification. He redeemed us entirely. But in the change of our life, he wants us to cooperate because if you just... It's, uh, he's just not like that. God's not magical. He's more powerful than any magic. But if he just, whoosh, like that, then suddenly the habit patterns that you set up, suddenly you're not who you are. And in order for you to keep who you are, you've got to cooperate in the change or you lose your identity. That's very dangerous. It's very dangerous to lose your identity. And so things that are not so good and you want to change, the center of your personality wants to change to become more and more like him, you deny self. You do without you go through hardship. He purges that away. You don't go back. You don't choose your own way. You want it, but you don't choose it. And when you don't choose it, and you keep doing that, then uh, he, he purges that out of you. Purges that out of you. That makes you a different person. So a year later, somebody comes up to you and says, Oh, you've been with God. Well, you were, you were with him when you were saved. But you're different now. What does it mean? It means there is a progressive walk with him. There is in prayer and in obedience and in coming to church, there is a uh, changing going on that you are cooperating with. You're cooperating with it by denying self. You're cooperating with it by rejoicing in hardship. That's what Hebrews 12 means. He says here, don't be upset because you're in all these things. These things are after you. This is the chastening of God because you belong to Him. And He's trying to bring you to Christ's likeness. He's trying to bring you to holiness. So you see, uh, sanctification is holiness. Sanctification is getting rid of the selfishness that is within us so that He may wholly occupy the life. And it's, not like, it's not like medieval mysticism. We don't lose our identity. Anytime we want to, we can get up and act bad and reassert the self. The identity, uh, see, the personhood's still there. But after you get used to Jesus being there, you don't want to get up and act bad. You want to cooperate. You've got oneness. You've got two personalities. You've got Jesus living, not like Jesus, two natures, but you've got two personalities living, Jesus living within, and you just cooperate with him. He knows what's best. 
He knows the right location. He knows the right companion. He knows the right school. He knows the right destination. He knows what trip is right. He knows all of these things. And so as you cooperate with Him, something tremendous happens. You become the temple of the Holy Ghost and you become the personality that you were intended to be. You are very beautiful. But you're far more beautiful than you think you are. I'm not talking about uh, Narcissus. I'm not talking about carnal admiration. But you're just a lot more beautiful than you think you are. I want you to know when you've got your eyes on Jesus and, I, and the pastors up here catch your face, I don't tell you something, the beauty of it is so great. And then, but a lot of people don't know that they, in their disobedience they don't look like Jesus at all. And you take one look at their face and you want to hide. Well, we ministers are on the spot up here. See, because <laughs> what we look like probably depends on what we've done the day before. Whether or not the carnal nature has been assertive or whether the loveliness of Jesus. And usually a man of God is thinking what's happening on Sunday and he's thinking about that and he's praying about that. And most men of God, men of God shine on Sunday because they've been obeying God on Saturday. Most parishioners don't look too good on Sunday because it's a day of choice and they choose against God's will. I'm sorry. See? Why well, you can live right Monday, you got to. You got to punch in. That's God's will to work. Routine salvation for some of us. But Saturday comes, and some of us don't work on Saturday, and we got choices now. And the carnal nature will choose wrongly most all of the time. So carnal nature will not choose for prayer. Carnal nature, carnal nature will not choose to visit the widow. The carnal nature will choose usually <clears throat> what brings selfishness uh, a little lift. I've noticed this, and Brother Helm said this t tremendous thing. He said, our hearing on Sunday depends on, a part, on our obedience on Saturday. And Saturday is such a tremendous day of choice for most people. For most people because the routine, the routine is over with. Now, how do we get ready for sanctification? Obviously, God is the only one who can sanctify us. But the scriptures say something funny. It says, uh, get up and sanctify yourselves. Well, we can't make ourselves holy. What does it mean? It, it means preparation. It means, and this is the first part of sanctification, set yourself apart. Set yourself apart from worldliness. Set yourself apart from that which you know is wrong. Set yourself apart... Wait upon God and ask Him to direct you that day or any other day and, and, and set yourself apart to say, I'm going to be devoted to God. I'm going to deny myself. And Paul said we had to die daily. So to keep the carnal nature from coming back and dominating, I believe at salvation the carnal nature is held in check. I believe that Brother Helm's experience, now I'm in an opinion here and I'm going on to the last part, but... I believe that what happened to Brother Ham up in uh, uh, Taylor, when the, God said, Lauren, what are you going to do about your sanctification? He said, nothing. And the great Paul Reeves was preaching, said, what are you going to do about it? He said, nothing. Can you imagine this great man? He said, nothing, not a thing. I think it was about the fourth time God spoke, and then he thought he was going to turn to rock. Now listen, this man didn't have a lot of choice in the matter, and neither did Paul. That tells you a little bit about who he is. Listen, Lauren Helm was going to be sanctified. You say, well, why didn't God do that to me? Be because, my friends, he has the perfect plan, and in his election he knows who he is going to have mercy upon and how he's going to have that mercy. By God's grace, Brother Helm was going to lead us along this path, and he had the hand of God upon him. He had the background and the preparation in such a way, even to the point of not arguing with his brothers, that when he got to that place, there's no way he was going to back up simply because he and his father was convinced there wasn't anything to it. And because people who claimed to be sanctified didn't pay their bills. That kind of thing, God wasn't impressed with those arguments. He just said, you're, you're going to be sanctified. And he thought he was going to lose his life. So he didn't want to lose his life. He thought he was going to die. He knew God was in control. God was pushing. So he steps out and thought he hollered on the way down there as loud as he could. Oh, God, sanctify me. His wife said she didn't even hear him. 
That's a, quite a situation, isn't it? But inside he was hollering, Oh, God, sanctify me. And when he did, something clicked. It's in the book. Something clicked right in there. Sanctification started. I believe God, I believe God nailed her down real good and put a real brace on her, a real check, until he could walk long enough in the justified life. And I am so thrilled with this. I thought it would be great if it happened to me, but I don't think it's going to happen this way. I thought it would be great to be sound asleep and, and, and the, the, the whole power fall on me while I'm still asleep. There's not much effort in that. He's sound asleep, and a woman's, a lady's praying next door, uh, not too far from this village here. She's praying next door, this wonderful lady that we read about in the book, and he's sound asleep, and the power comes. The power, God's presence comes and sweeps into his life. And in the book, it indicates that those things, all along, God was, remember on his sick bed, he was being sanctified. All along, God was working things out of him. But in that moment, he swept all those things out, some 30 to 40 things, the power of God's presence, and they were all swept up. Now listen, friends, he, he was a vastly different man when he awakened that morning. And it was four hours of liquid love, and he shouted, and he shouted, and he shouted, and he, you'd shout too. Listen, here, here we've had a hunger for God this morning. What if God had come in and wiped all out of us that's contrary to his will and purpose? What if he'd come and, come in and suddenly selfishness was nailed clear out? And here, we, here God did an entire work of sanctification, and the Holy Spirit, listen, oh, let me tell you something. I, we may go down and weep for four or five hours, but there would be some kind of reaction that would show appreciation. His was shouting. He shouted, and he shouted. It's because the human life can hardly taint, contain the mighty power of God. Christ died for our sanctification. And we know a man by God's grace whose experience, entire sanctification, whose experience, the eradication of the carnal nature. I was thinking all last year, in all the darkness and all the trouble, I didn't hear him mention once. I didn't hear him say once, once, did I hear him mention a word of criticism about this or that or the other or why the problem is or why is this. wasn't that. He told us to pray for him. He was hurting. He said, I need prayer more than I've ever needed in my life. He said all that. But in all that time, though I, those eyes were filled with love. I'm sure he didn't want to rehearse any of that lest he be touched with that which he was delivered from. And there's, no, there's nothing worth that. Nothing worth all. Vera said when you get to the edge of glory, no amount of carnality is worth it. Said she said nothing. Once you get, she saw it right at the edge of glory. It isn't worth. Not one carnal moment is worth what you see on the other side. So, by God's wonderful grace, this marvelous experience came into his life, and that is in answer to the cry, "O oh Lord, to be like Thee, O oh Lord, to be like Thee." See, it's more than words, because down deep inside we got a battle going on. We want to do good, but but we do evil. That's in Romans seven been exceedingly hard for the holiness movement to recognize that that there is their experience. Very difficult. I'm probably into it with somebody here this morning, but just take me to Jesus and if you feel like I'm wrong, just ask Jesus to help me. But it's been very difficult for the... But listen, when you and I exercise our own will, I'm not talking about in the cardinal sense, but when we do what we want to, and we go where we want to, and we choose the church we want to, and we, uh, we pretty much run our own lives, that we want to do good, we pled the blood, but that is Romans 7. We want to do good, but the evil takes us over. When Paul said, when Paul said I'm crucified from all of this, he wasn't even talking about X-rated TV, they didn't even have it. He wasn't talking about the Roman baths. He wasn't talking about all this. He was talking about being crucified from the religious ideas. For he's talking about circumcision and non-circumcision in the context of that same passage. Oh, to be crucified from religious ideas. To be open to God and to be humble. Not to be self-assertive about our doctrine. Because it could be that we're doctrinaire at a point. It could be that we're slightly fanatical, a little bit off. There's going to be a whole lot more people with wrong doctrine in heaven. Impossible.
Uh, Pastor Wormbrand said when he was in communist prisons, he said, I met men who were called to preach the gospel who had never seen more than one page of the New Testament. He said their doctrine was atrocious, but he said their spirit was of Christ. He said it was Catholics, it was Pentecostals, it was Baptists. He said, and the Catholic nuns and priests were the toughest to crack. Because they had in their minds the idea that they were married to Jesus, which we're all supposed to be. And they had so separated themselves from their family. I'm talking about the true ones. I know not all Catholic priests are saved and not all nuns are saved. But I want to tell you something. He met Catholic priests that were saved. And his wife, over where she was, she met nuns that were saved. They couldn't crack them because they were married to Jesus. They'd already given up their families. They'd already made Jesus first so they could burn their flesh and beat their feet and put the cries of their family through the loudspeakers and they couldn't break them. They held on to God. And for months and months and months and months and months and finally the communist says, well, what is Jesus like? I don't want to know what he's like. And the man in a moment of desperation, but great inspiration, said to him, well, he's like me. And the communist said, then I want him. If he's like you, then I want him. And this great godly man that Pastor Wormbrand said was the most godly man he ever met in communist prisons led this former co communist to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he became like Jesus because he saw Jesus in this precious man there. Isn't, oh, isn't that great? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> this, is, this is certainly a sanctification. Think of Pastor Wormbrand's wife. He met the man who killed her mother and daddy. He met, he met the, Naz, the Nazi uh, prisoner, or the, the captor, the, the man, the jailer. He met him. And he talked to him and he said, where were you? Where were you over? And he realized that was the very jail and the very time, the very prison in which his wife's parents were killed and all of her family. And so he felt led to talk to him about Jesus. And he said, would you go home with me? This man was so guilty over all these shot babies and kill mothers that were pregnant and ripped them open and all sorts of things you could never get any relief from. No amount of psychiatry could ever help you in, in uh, this world or in some other continent. You couldn't get rid of it. But Wormbrand was telling him of the blood of Jesus that could, that could take care of all of that. He said, I want you to go home with me. He said, you are the jailer that killed my wife's parents and after he told him the circumstance he said well indeed I'm the one and he said I'm going to I'm going to tell you something he said we're going in the front room and I want to predict my wife's reactions he said we're going to get her out of bed we're going to bring her into the front room we're going to tell her what you've done you're the one here's the man that's killed all of her people we're going to tell her and he said then I'm going to tell you her reactions Oh, blessed be God. I'm going to tell you what she's, how she's going to respond. He said, she will look at you. She will fall around your neck. She will weep. And she will say, I forgive you. And then while went, after we've had prayer, she will fix you a meal and invite you to her table. If you like Christianity, you're getting a good dose of it now. Maybe you just thought you had it. But if you like what Jesus did for us, you've got it here and now. Maybe you ju maybe just thought you wanted it, but this is the heart of it involved. So he took the jailer home, this tormented man, this man that needed peace but could get no peace. And he brought, he was hesitant because it's one or a woman didn't jump around, scratch his eyes out, beat him to death, or pull a pistol and shoot him dead. If there had been any carnal nature dominant here, we'd have had some problems on our hand. But he got home and he said, so bind it, honey, come in here. I got someone I want you to meet. And she came in, sat down and said, honey, this is the jailer that killed your parents. And he reviewed the story <laughs> and she looked at him. And when he finished the whole story, she jumped up and she threw her arms around his neck and she said, oh, I forgive you. I forgive you. And they prayed a prayer with him, and he repented of his sins. And when this great, great thing had come to pass, then she said, I want to prepare you a meal. And she went in and prepared a meal, and they brought this, this great, 
perpetrator of atrocities into their table and there they got around the table that became the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ and there they fellowshiped in Zion and they put all the sins behind them just as Jesus had done on the cross. I want you to know that is what Jesus died for. He died to wash away our sins, but he died to change us. He died to make us like him. And it is through the power of the blood that this comes to pass. It's through the power of obedience. You say, I can't do it. Just obey. You can take one step at a time. He'll lead you right into this experience. Why do I know that? If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin, S-I-N. I mean, he works right in there to take the carnal nature out. Take that step. You'll die taking it. Take it. You'll feel like you're lost. Take it. It may be as black as midnight as when the, uh, Dr. Ms. Him left everything to go with the Lord Jesus Christ, but that's all right. Jesus is in control. Take that step. That step is going to wing you from some, some things. That step is going to get rid of selfishness. That step is going to do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. It's an impossibility, but you can die at that moment, and he'll undergird with you, you with divine power. He will strengthen you, and he will change you a little bit or a little more. As you read the word of God and as you wait upon him, he reaches in there and after a few hundred thousand hours of prayer, then he'll say, this is wrong, my child. It's offensive, it's ugly, and it's more of hell than it is of heaven. And, he, and you can repent over that and he'll cleanse that out of your personality. It won't be there anymore. If it tries to come back, you've got the power to resist it. That's sanctification. And it comes to us by the blood. And it gets us ready for the moments in the kingdom that he's prepared us for. And some of us have been prepared for one moment, primarily in the kingdom of God, unless the blood of Christ has not only saved us, but sanctified us, we'll miss the moment. Many of us are prepared for one moment primarily. And we don't want to miss it. By God's grace and by God's mercy. And so we read our text again. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy, to sanctify them through his own blood. So he says to these Roman Christians who are backing up, and who are backing up from persecution, the very thing that's going to bring them to holiness. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. Keep in mind that they were called atheists because they wouldn't worship all those gods. Imagine a person who loves God being called an atheist. They only had one God over there called the unknown God. And Paul said that he's the only one that's real. He's the one that came to die for our sins. But they had to take a disgrace. In every age, there's great disgrace to being what's really true, what's really right, and being part of the remnant. But that, that outpouring of negativeness upon you, if you will respond rightly to it, will only be captured to make you what Jesus That's why he wants you to be. That's why he says, tribulation worketh patience. Isn't it wonderful that the blood supplied a complete answer? How awful would it be just to be born in this world to be saved from sin and not have power to live, not have power to live over it? How wonderful would it be? Why that Pat took power for Sabina to do that. That took the power of God for that man, that righteous man, righteous through the blood of Jesus, to say, "He's like me." That took grace for Pastor Wormran and all those 14 years to be in communist prisons and to love, to love the communists so much that when he got out, he set up a mission station to send the gospel back into the communist countries. And now he has one in 81 countries, which is far more than, than, uh, than the communist countries. Oh, to have a heart like Jesus. Oh, sanctification is a continual agreement in the heart of his will and his purpose. It cancels, it eradicates the rebellion that's in there through Father Adam and Mother Eve and makes us completely agreeable 
He begins it. He does it as quickly as he can, but not too quickly because it scares us pretty bad. But he's gentle with us, but he keeps leading us on so that the great moment comes when he does the final work. All along, he's using us and helping us and working with us, and God's doing wonderful things. There are thrills, adventure, and romance. But oh, for the day when the carnal nature is slain. Oh, for the day when the prayer will be answered. Why did we sing it this morning if we didn't believe it? That is, we heard it through Jules, through here. Oh, to have a heart like Jesus. Jesus never had his own way. He only willed to do what his father said. He always denied himself, and if he ever had a chance to back up, it was in Gethsemane because he didn't want our sins really upon him to separate him from his father, but it was his father's will. So for his father's will and for our sake and that you and I might be sanctified, he shed a blood so powerful that not only washes away all that we've ever done, it actually changes us and makes us sons of God indeed. No wonder we praise the blood. No wonder we're thankful for the truth of song says that blood shall never lose its power. No wonder we've got hope within us today. No wonder we're looking to Jesus. We have a promise that he can fully meet if we deny self and we walk with him and we don't resist the tribulations that's necessary for our life. God sanctifies us by the blood and turns us into a son of God indeed. Till when a person sees us, they don't really see us so much. They see Jesus. What the communist man saw was not so much the person, and yet it was the person. But it was Jesus. It was the beautiful face of our Lord. And it was a changed man whose personality was like Adam when he was first created. A face that you want to be with. <laughs> a face that you love. A face that gives and a face that cares. And a face that cares more about you than it does itself. For we're to think more highly of others than we do of ourselves. It is in the work of sanctification that's wrought by the blood of Christ outside of the camp the place was called Calvary Calvary